This is Jason Anderson, Chairman of the Killing the Town Council. It is currently 7 p.m. on Tuesday, August 8th. Um, we are going to open up the public hearing on items 7A, 7B, and item 14A. If we can also remind people that some people are in overflow and in the hallway listening, so if they can limit their conversations in the audience to help people as well. Um, just so everyone's aware, we do have a lot of a lot of people in attendance that aren't just who people in the room. We do have people in the overflow and out in the hallway as well. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're coming up to speak. So items 7A, 7B, and 14A. Um, Ms. Caloria, can you just go over these, please? Sure. So item 7A is the consideration and action on an ordinance to authorize the purchase and sale agreement to sell the town property located at 125 Alexander Parkway to Any Edge LLC. The sale of the parcel is for $5 million for uh, $4,800, and that is uh, a 39-acre parcel of property located in the industrial park um, right at the kind of at the intersection intersection top uh, intersection of Alexander Parkway and Louisa Vines for anyone that's uninterested in uh, that's unfamiliar where that property location is I do have property maps um, that are over on the table so you can see where the actual property location is um, it is currently um, undeveloped property there is a number of uh, there is a um, Eversource uh, CLMP easement and an, uh, another easement that runs uh, uh, across the property as well 7B is um, consideration and action on an ordinance authorizing a transfer of up to $746,742 to the established unexpended education funds account. This is a request by the Board of Education for the fiscal year 21-22 um, uh, unexpended educational funds annually they can make the request to deposit unexpended funds up to the fund uh, the agreement that the Town Council and the Board of Education has which is a cap of two million dollars currently um, that's uh, a balance would uh, cap out that fund for uh, that year to the two million dollar number <clears throat> um, that number the reason why it's coming now is because we do that transfer and complete that process after the audit has been completed and the audit didn't complete this year until uh, really uh, the end of May, the beginning of June really. And so that is why it's now being taken up. Um, it does require going to special town meeting due to the dollar amount. And then lastly, the public hearing. So those are two, those two items are required to go to special town meeting. The item 14A, which is only a public hearing, is for revisions, um, an consideration and action on an ordinance amending Chapter 7, and this implements revisions required by FEMA to participate in the flood insurance program, and these are revisions to the town's flood management ordinance as required by the FEMA flood map, flood map updates and the national insurance program updates. If anybody Thank wants full, you know, the full copies of those, there are some copies still left on the. Well, I think there Thank are you, they, they are on the website as well. Um, so, anyone who would like to speak to any of these three items, um, when you come up, just state your name and address, and also if you could, um, just which item you're speaking to, whether you're speaking to the uh, land purchase. Uh, by any edge the money for the transfer for the unexpended education fund or the change in the ordinance for the um, the national flood insurance program so anyone who would like to speak please come up to the mic um, we just ask you keep your actually we don't have a we don't have a time limit on public hearing you, only on you our can set a public you can set a limit on public hearing if you okay. so desire the agenda that's on public comment not on the public hearing yep. yeah. so anyone who would like to speak please come up to the podium and state your name and address
Jen, can you verify that that's up the podium? Yep. Lois Latraverse, 64 Island Road. Um, I'm speaking on the authorization of the sale of the land um, for the data center. So I have some concerns, mostly about the company that the town has contracted with to do this job. Um, I feel as if it's been embroiled and it is in a lawsuit and it's two years old. I just wish that the town wasn't doing this job with this company because I, I think that the town could have managed to get a, a data center company or a company that develops data centers that wasn't involved in this kind of lawsuit. I, I'm afraid that this is going to tie up the town for three or four or five years. Permitting itself takes time, but being embroiled in a lawsuit, I wonder if that's going to alter their ability to get investors. I, I'm just afraid that the town is going to end up in a situation where we're, we're not in the best situation. So that's, that's a concern. My other concern is in the um, amount of electricity they're going to use. I suspect that Lake Road Generating will be operating a lot more in order to provide the electricity because that's a lot of electricity. If they do, in fact, develop 500,000 square feet with these um, servers, that high-end servers that they want to use, Lake Road Generating, I suspect, will be called on. I know the grid says that they can handle it, and I hope that's true, uh, but that is a concern. So when it's all said and done, my other concern will be the noise factor because I know that the cooling is going to be a huge uh, condensers on the top of this building. So I know it's in a location, it's in a better location than a, a lot of the other industrial parcels and hopefully I know in the contract the town has put in requirements for acoustical tiles and all of that. I'm concerned about the study, the noise study is only being done from one location. That's an issue we'll deal with later uh, should this come to pass. Uh, because I do think that you need to do noise studies from more than one location. But um, that's, those are my concerns. I don't know about the, the school board money. I, I don't understand that. Is it going into the non-lapsing fund? So then will they meet that cap of $2 million? Still annoying me that the taxes had to go up this year when they had $2 million that they could have taken. Okay, that's my bit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gloria, if we can just clarify one thing. The town did not contract with any edge to build this data center. Correct. The, t okay. the uh, developer uh, approached the town uh, has already entered into purchase uh, and sale agreements with two, uh, with uh, adjacent property owners. It's um, uh, the, the development uh, enco encompasses uh, three parcels of land, um, including the 125 Alexander Parkway, um, and um, it's there they came to propose that uh, development to the town. The town didn't uh, individually contract with them. Thank you. Um, now, if the town were to try and um, market the parcel we have, for a data center of this size. Our parcel wouldn't be big enough for a data center of this size, correct? correct. Okay. And so the other two parcels are privately owned. They're not owned by the town. Um, and to my knowledge, the town doesn't have any track record of trying to market private individuals' properties for a project. Correct. We don't own those parcels. We don't okay. have a right to those parcels. Okay. Uh, and uh, one thing to speak to as far as the comment, as far as Lake Road running more, um, if the data center is built here or is built in another town, um, if ISO New England is the one who's saying who's firing up next on the grid, um, whether the data center is built here, it's built in Plainfield, it's built somewhere else, um, l let's say it's built in a, in a neighboring town and Lake Road's the next one called the fire because there's a need on the grid, then at that point the surrounding town, whatever town it's in, is going to get 
the benefit of the tax revenue coming in um, and we would be stuck with the air pollution um, considering my personal opinion um, not I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of the council this is my personal opinion um, bringing something in like this um, if there's going to be a data center which I know there's a lot of interest to put a data center in Connecticut the state of Connecticut is pushing to have a data center built here in Connecticut um, if one's going to get built and it's going to require power from the grid and Lake Road is the next one called by ISO to fire I would rather it be here where we're seeing some benefit rather than getting just the negative impacts from Lake Road generating running more um, and, and that's we have no control over who ISO calls on to fire I will let anyone else come up and speak Uh, good evening, I'm Mark Johnston, uh, 3A South Shore Road. Um, how many people is this plant, this da data center, going to employ? Um, I know this was brought up before, Ms. Clory. I don't remember the numbers it, off the top it was of my head. It's estimated to be about 80 full-time employees. 80, with 49 acres. Uh, no, so this is again the parse the data center is going to be located over three parcels of land The 39 acres is only one of the three parcels that they're purchasing and locating the data center on and So it's located over three parcels of land. This is only current, one of the yeah. three And what is what is the total acreage that this, the town is sell, sell, sell the, town, the town the town is selling 39, 39 acres 39 yes. mm -hmm. Was that used for federal funds? And the purpose was was for, for jobs. I'm sorry, I don't understand your Alrighty, question. When that when that park was developed, in order to develop the park, you had federal funds that came in for the main, for the main purpose of a, 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 a substantial jobs. And I'm not quite sure if this would qualify. This parcel wasn't received as part of the original industrial park uh, development. This was received subsequent afterwards as a conveyance from um, uh, CLMP in 2002. Gotcha. Thank you. I remember that. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. John LaBelle, 57 Island Road, Dayville. I have a quick question for the council. How many of your council people are at large great well I'm in district 2 and I understand you also represent district 2 and appreciate your representation and to the other members I appreciate everything you do to try to keep our town in the stead that it's in I know it's just going over the minutes of the meetings and the agendas I don't know how you do it. Thank you. My comments will start with <laughs> Jason. We'll start with the um, 125 Alexander Parkway. The Killingly property land involved in this transaction is referred to as Exhibit A. The legal description of the property in the purchase and sale agreement, which is also referred to. In the call of the meeting and is not attached to the contract. I could not find Exhibit A anywhere. Also, Schedule 2 property information is not attached. I could not find that. 
The question is, does this make this hearing and town meeting null and void? The purchase price for the property is $5 million and some odd cents to be paid at the closing. The um, closing is not very well defined in the contract. In the um, state statute, it's defined as start of construction. That's about five years out from the signature on the contract. So you've got two things on the contract. You've got the signature of the contract, and you've got the effective date of the contract. I'm confused as to which is which, and I'm uh, trying to get an answer right now, but I, I don't know if anybody else is confused. So the purchase price for the property of $5 million is to be paid at the closing. So that payment could be and I hope I'm wrong, could be as far out as five years. Um, the value of this land is not created by the land. It's the opportunity created by 395, the power, and the data. Nothing to do with the land. The land just happens to be there. Okay? So when we get a vendor who comes in and says, I'm going to pay you $5 million, for a piece of land that's valued at about $150,000, an assessment of 100, makes you kind of wonder as to what's going on if we couldn't get more for that land. And also, the sale of this land is based upon a proposal from one company and has not been competitively bid. In all my years of managing projects, I've always worked for owners that felt that it was important to get competition in the in the bidding process. I think that when we look, this is not about the host agreement. Are we allowed to talk about the host agreement? Yes, you can because the host agreement is part of the uh, the project that's proposed for this parcel that's up for sale. Okay, thank you. Um, the host agreement has uh, incentives for the town payment in lieu of taxes for 30 years. Um, this site, according to the statute, is required to be a 30-year contract. Now, the state has an option as to whether they do a 20 or a 30-year contract, but it, if you read the statute, the 20-year contract is for a different, is for an enterprise zone. This is, I, under, I understand it is not in an enterprise zone. So um, it has to be a 30-year contract. And the payment in lieu of taxes, I'm confused by whether it's 2.5 million a year or 3.5 because they have a benchmark where once the investor has invested X amount of money, it ties to whether it's 2.5 or 3.5. And um, based on my experience, it would take anywhere from six to nine years or so to get to the point of a $400 million investment, um, unless they really go fast. Now, the, the legislation allows for a five-year uh, period of um, of review, they have to apply for a permit at the three-year stage, at which point they still have two years to actually get a permit. They have time to do due diligence. The due diligence period goes beyond the issuance of a building permit, which I don't understand. I've never had that happen. Uh, but if the due diligence uh, goes beyond that, then they're allowed time to, to continue to do the due diligence. And during the due diligence, they're allowed to back out of the deal five years later. I, 
I've never had the advantage of something like this in the projects that I've had to manage. Uh, the Foxwoods Casino, the first casino, was built in 180 days. Um, and I suggest one option is to have the host agreement fees based off of power consumption, similar to the Groton proposed contract. If you've been following any of this, they've got a number of towns that they've had contracts. Each one has a different version of it, okay? Um, so, but based on the power consumption, you probably, and I'm not an expert at this, could get competitive bid without compromising the current, the current proposer. The current proposer could still bid on a, on a, on a, on that basis. I mean, obviously the proposal they have now is out. Everybody knows what it is, but if it's based on some kind of metric, then you can get competition. I have concerns about this vendor. He has, has he disclosed his assets and abilities to complete this project to a successful completion? How could he possibly implement this project given that he has proposals in process to potentially build data centers in Groton, Waterford, Bosra, and now in Killingly? Each of these requires a significant amount of capital, time, and resources. How could one person, well, I haven't seen an organization, org, org chart, which filed with the Secretary of State is one person. How could one person be able to support all this? During his presentation to council in June, I asked him a number of questions pertaining to the operation of the pro proposed facility. And his response was, he's just a salesman. <laughs> he's just trying to get a contract. It's interesting to note that the questions that I asked do not appear on the minutes of that meeting. Transparency, I'm concerned about transparency here, statewide, national-wise. We need to be more transparent. And I talk as a elected official, a former elected official. I am also concerned about the potential impact of the two lawsuits. You never know how these are gonna go. They could get dismissed. One in Massachusetts, one in Rhode Island, in federal court, against any edge, how would that impact Killingly, as Lois was saying. My vote is to terminate discussions with this company, vote down the proposed agreement, retain a professional to write an RFP to obtain competitive bids for the construction of an appropriate, state-of-the-art, energy-efficient, zero-carbon data center, include that the property reverts back to the town after five years in the absence of measured performance. Establish a metric, okay? Here's your performance. We all have that at our jobs, right? Establish a metric in an RFP and say, okay, here's the metric. We're gonna hold you to this standard. If you don't perform, we're gonna pull the contract. By the way, I don't find in this contract, and I haven't slept with it, information that tells me how to arbitrate a disagreement. It states in the contract, which is contrary to um, the state law, that they waive any trial to settle any dispute. It's the only f paragraph I could find that talks about how to protect the town in the event of a dispute. Oh, it's also interesting to note that there are seven data centers run by six organizations already in Connecticut, now located in Bridgeport, Hartford, Norwalk, Stanford. Why were these companies not approached to provide a proposed data center in Killingly? Observation of some of the content of the purchase and sale agreement. The purchaser may terminate the agreement for no reason whatsoever. Just walk away without reason during the due diligence period. Just walk away. In which case the earnest money that has not been forwarded to the seller is to be returned. So money put into escrow 
that's not been forwarded to Kiln. We have fifty thousand dollars a year for five years. Gets returned. The due diligence period extends beyond obtaining the first building permit, which can take three to eight years. The earnest money, although called non-refundable, can be refunded during the due diligence, with the possible exception of fifty thousand dollars. The seller shall not enter into any agreement. This is interesting. The seller shall not enter into any agreements to sell the property after the effective date of this agreement, which tells me that if I'm the town of Killingly, I can continue to market this land even after I've signed this agreement. That's on page seven. Anybody want to look it up? The purchaser may sign this contract under certain conditions, which when I read, I think it's they can assign up to 49% of their agreement with you to somebody else. Now, there might be a paragraph in there that requires them to get your approval to do that. The agreement is also subject to and contingent on closing of the properties located at 141 Louise Drive. In other words, the other two parties to building this potential data center. Um, they have to close on those properties. And it's interesting that it says that it has to be simultaneous. I don't know how you do that. Oh, and the escrow agent has to sign the agreement in order for it to be completed. The um, Department of Economic Development requires vetting of the application. Um, and uh, I can talk for another five minutes or so if everybody's okay with that. Um, their, required, their required submittal includes an impact analysis. The municipal, obviously, the municipal host agreement, capital structure and ownership details, five-year budget of capital expenditures, preliminary list of entities that will use the sales and use tax exemption for the proposed site. This will need to be modified over the term of the contract to reflect entities authorized to use the exemption. Does every, everybody here understand what this agreement is? The, the statute is that allows this to happen. Well, basically, what the state did in, in 2021 was to pass legislation that allowed for a data center operator to come into a town, establish a host agreement, and go to the state and say, we have a host agreement, and now we want to establish a contract where we don't pay any sales taxes that companies would normally pay. So that's the incentive for them to come into the community. The second part of the incentive is to negotiate a host agreement with the community, wherein they get what I would call payment lieu of taxes. They don't call it that, they call it a fee. Okay, so they pay the community a fee. That can be a win-win situation for the community. By the way, I'm not speaking against a data center Okay, my opinion is that we need to put this out to bid, get competitive bid, and take advantage of the marketplace. If you go on the internet, you'll see what's going on, okay? To me, five years to allow a company to come in, establish an agreement with you, spend no money, turn around and flip it to somebody else, as a value added because they've got a host agreement and a potential agreement with the state. That's part of what I think, I mean, that's what I would do if I were in a marketplace that I didn't want to spend any money and make a lot of money. Okay, that's one. Number two is five years. The whole market can change in five years. By the time I get my data center built, 
I mean, I've got five years to get a building permit. It's going to take me another two years to build this building. And in the meantime, I won't break ground unless I have contracts with at least 50% occupancy in this building. Okay? So once you sign a deal, once the state signs a deal, I'm out there marketing this to fill it. I won't break ground unless I've got 50% of my equity. And I'm going to take deposits. So, okay. Capital structure and ownership details. Five-year budget. Preliminary list of entities. Letter of good standing from the Connecticut Department of Revenue Services. A business plan. A current business plan. Business financial statements. CPA prepared financial statements. Cash flow. Taxes paid. Personal financial statements of ownership of 10% or more of the company. Schedule of related affiliated companies, et cetera. That's what the state will require. Oh, why aren't we requiring, requiring the same? Um, in terms of the host agreement, I covered a couple pieces of it. I think I covered enough of that. Um, are we also covering the, uh, re uh, the stores on over at the park, the transfer of... Uh, no, okay. Well, you'll be surprised. I guess I'm all, I'm all out of talk. <laughs> I want to thank you for your patience and your time and attention to this. Please do what's right for the taxpayer of Killingly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now, as far as going out to bid, as I had stated before, um, our parcel that we own is not big enough to put a data center of this size on. If we were to go out to bid our parcel to find someone to put a data center on it, I don't believe you could put a data center big enough to be eligible for the tax incentives that the state legislature has put in, put in place. So at that point, I think we would be wasting our time trying to go out to bid for a data center because what will fit on our parcel isn't going to qualify for any of the tax incentives would not quali would they would not be required to have a host fee agreement with the town um, because the investment in it wouldn't be big enough um, can I respond to that what was that can I respond to that my creative side would do a walk around RFP that would incorporate the abutters there's a way to do it. The, the town has not entered into anything like that before, to my knowledge. Um, and I would have to speak to the town attorney to see if that's something we could even do. Um, okay. Because at that point, be then you're to, trying, you're trying to, to sell land under, out from underneath people. I'm and sorry. what happens if they don't want to sell? Are you entertaining those questions along the way of doing your preliminary draft? Um, we ha a public hearing does not have a time limit as far as minutes or um, the length of it. We can set that. That's during our normal public comment period that the town council rules of procedure do have the five minute limit. But a public hearing, there was no limit set tonight. Um, so. But Jason, the town meeting actually starts at eight o'clock, so yeah. we only so have, 25 we have minutes. 25 minutes at this point. Um, just to be aware the town council will need to take action prior to going to special town meeting yep so you will need to allow for time for yep. that um, any other thing as far as basing a host fee agreement on um, megawatt usage the town of Groton is a public utility company that they own the town of killing does not own a utility company so you're not comparing apples to apples as far as looking at it that way I will open up to anyone else who wants to come out and speak <clears throat> Hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm a local resident. My name is Ty Trotter, and uh, I just wanted to come up and show support for this project and uh, its local work for oh, 6 Schoenman Avenue. Uh, I just wanted to come up and show support because it's uh, local work for local people. 
So I uh, really hope that the project goes through. And I just wanted to come up for a second and voice my support for it. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. Dave Farland, Killingly resident. Um, yeah, I'm in favor of the project. Um, oh, and Knox Avenue, 86 Knox Ave. And um, I mean, think about the building you're talking about here. It's not much pollution. It's not going to take much water. It'll be some draw on electricity, but th those people have to figure that out. Um, I mean, when you look at the land, it's, I mean, a lot of it is just damn near desert anyways. I mean, just from the air, I mean, they might improve the land. Um, and it's a lot of money you're talking about. And the uh, only other thing I can speak about it is, we have the local jobs. Obviously, local residents making good money and taking care of what they gotta take care of. But um, the other thing, yeah, I know about the contractor, uh, Turner. Um, no, they're, they're everything buttoned up on their end. I'm, I'm sure of that. And uh, thanks. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Jason Dexter. I'm a local resident, uh, born and raised. Um, after Address, please. What's that? Address, please. 111 Pleasant View Drive, Dayville. After many years in construction on the road, um, I have the privilege of working at, here at KMS, um, and I'm in favor of the project. If it benefits all of Kilnley residents and its workers. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Joshua Lara. I'm a resident of Killingly uh, for the past 30 years. Address? Uh, 609 Pettingill Road. Uh, and I approve the vote. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to items 7A, 7B, or 14A? Just state your name and address, please. Amy Sterling, 924 Upper Maple. Um, just, I speak more as an environmentalist, and I saw that the land goes down to the river, so is that to tap the water or to exit water no okay and um, I don't know if at this stage of discussion you talk about the, does the Conservation Commission come in yet to make suggestions for preservation of some open space or something um, no there actually is uh, some areas that are already in here that are already have uh, uh, wetlands that will be okay. there's so the 39 acres the vast majority of it's not developable mm -hmm. um, there is a l fair amount of um, uh, open um, wetlands that are on the property um, which uh, we've already discussed you know that would be preserved obviously and they would have to go through the various commissions that are required for their uh, mm -hmm. application process yeah. okay and then the other is a detail because this is a new language for me um, the host agreement and the town with the town that they don't have to pay sales tax. I That's can actually the state. The state. So the, the Minnesota Host Field Agreement has nothing to do with sales tax. That's the state legislation. The state put that in the state legislation to incentivize the place the um, and attract data centers to locate in the state of Connecticut mm -hmm. by exempting the uh, properties from sales tax mm -hmm. and the development of them from sales tax. But that's a state incentive, not a local okay. municipal incentive. All right, so how will the town make money from this proposed? So that's the, the municipal host fee agreement yep. um, in, and that's really a payment in lieu of taxes. All right. And that is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's $165 million over 30 years on correct. top of the purchase of the property, which is what we're discussing tonight, which would be $5 million for the purchase property. Correct. One other thing I just do want to throw out there, um, in regards to purchase of property, our last offer we had on a property, Ms. Clorio, we actually had the property under contract to sell, and the buyer backed out. 
um, and that purchase price was seventy thousand. Seventy thousand mm -hmm. dollars, um, which is substantial difference between the offer we're getting right now for mm -hmm. five million dollars. Mm -hmm. So um, the state says you don't have to pay taxes and that's the incentive but mm -hmm. what will the i'm, I'm still I'm sorry a little muddied here what will the the uh business pay to the town 165 million dollars over oh yeah. 30 years so over roughly years. roughly we're getting over five million dollars a year in taxes okay is that good Could, <laughs> yes that and more <laughs> <laughs> More than any other entity we have in town yeah. currently. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. I'm Michael Poirier on 12 Cove Street in Danielson, and I'm a local resident. And um, I just want to say it will give us all local residents a good union job. It's gonna make you guys five million dollars a year for taxes, and also when it's built, it's gonna get a lot more other people good jobs around here. So it's nice that the kids are coming in, getting out of the tech schools. They can join us. You know what I mean? We're always looking for people, so it's a good opportunity for everybody. I think. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments? Adam Griffiths, 98 Griffiths Road. Is in the agreement that it will be union jobs that are used on this project? Is that part of the agreement that has gone through? No, I'm just asking. We have union workers that oh. are, are asking. They're saying that they want to support the, the local union jobs. Is that part of the agreement that the town made under the purchase and sales agreement that there would be union construction? Uh, no, not under the purchase and sale agreement. The developer has entered into a PLA, so they will be union positions. So they will be union positions. Also have a concern myself about how far this does go out without requiring a lot of money. Like John said, a lot of this money can be returned that is basically reimbursable. So the town can be out a long ways before we actually get any money, if we get any money at all. That's my main concern with this, is there's not a, it's not enough locked in. And also, how long that we took for the purchase and sales agreement with NTE and doing all of that and the due diligence there, it feels like this has moved very fast. And looking at the agreements, and especially the $165 million that you're saying, that's if they build out to their extent. There's also a table that goes down which shows if they don't go to that how much money it will be no if they build if they only build one building the municipal host fee, fee agreement is in full tact so it would still be 165 million over the course of the 30 years regardless if they only build one building or they build all three well the 2.5 versus 3.5 that's in the state statutes with regards to the other incentives they are locked into the municipal host fee agreement as it stands so even if they only build one of the buildings and the, in the language of the municipal host fee agreement, we would still be receiving the full value of the municipal host fee agreement. It is not prorated for the municipal host fee agreement. There are other incentives with the state may get prorated, but not the municipal host fee agreement. That's so. We That's are, our municipal host fee agreement. To me, to me, it looked like that it was only if it was to a certain extent that there was a itemized list that I had seen about how much money it would be over time if that was done. Understandable. The our municipal host fee agreement has it locked in at the value that it is regardless of how many buildings are built. But still we are only going to get a small amount and they still have the option of not doing anything over a very long period of time. The, um, the, the escrow earnest fee money the initial uh, payment of uh, uh, $100,000 is at the time of the signing of the purchase and sale agreement. That goes, it, that goes into the escrow account. Um, that gets increased um, uh, at 
year one and then at year two. At year two, the town starts receiving $50,000 a year that is not refundable. So that $50,000 comes to the town, paid to the town, not refundable out of that escrow. So the town is going to be receiving funds by year two. $50,000 for mm -hmm. that. But we're saying this is going to be we're hoping this is going to be multi-million dollars. Correct, but the concern but was whether or not we were going to lock up our property for long terms. That's exactly my concern. Are we, how far are we locking this property out and we don't, aren't going to be able to have control of it if it is something that has more advantageous than this? Thank you. Mary, Thank you. Prior to, can I? Mary, prior to the 70,000 sale that fell through, I am on. Prior to the 70,000 sale that fell through, how long was that land sitting with no revenue? Since it was uh, transferred to the town in 2002. Thank you. Mary, Mary what, at the $70,000 worth of the property, what is our, what would our tax base be if somebody actually owned that and paid taxes on it? You had me figure that out last time, and I didn't I think save it was twenty five hundred. You know, it was like thirty five hundred dollars, yeah, right, or less than that, I think. Mary, also after year two, um, year three would get another fifty yep. until the two hundred thousand is there. correct. The so two hundred fifty thousand is exhausted. We would be getting the two hundred thousand if they wait that long, but most companies aren't going to just throw away a quarter of a million dollars. At uh, a value of seventy thousand dollars, the annual taxes on that, based on the current year's mill rate, is little over thirteen hundred dollars a year. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I had to pull out the calculator. Dale Damaris, Country Club Road, Dayville. I'm not here to talk about the project. I'm not here to talk about the uh, owners of the, who wants to do it. I'm here to talk about the land. Most of you know here that land belongs to, people think it belongs to me, but it doesn't. It belongs to my son and his partner from Pennsylvania. We have a small gravel operation out there. That land is not worth anywhere near what they're willing to pay for it. Out of that 39 acres that they're willing to buy, there's probably three that are any good. There's 17 acres underneath the power lines that you need, if you want to drink a glass of water, you have to get a permit from Eversource. That's the God's honest truth. There's wetlands over the hill. I know a lot of you have been out there because I see the little Alexander uh, plates on the car coming out looking at what we're doing out there. So I know a lot of you know what's, what we're doing out there. So as you drive in, my son owns the land next to Pepsi. There's six. 0.7 acres of land there. Out of that, there's probably, I'm going to say five, not including sight lines. The previous owner before um, Kelp, the, the gravel operation, Gavi, dug gravel out. He dug holes all over the place. The town filled it in with street sweepings, loom, who knows what else. There's three acres behind that 6.7 acres. And out of that three, again, some of it's over the hill in wetlands. There's a big hole that's been filled in by town sweepings. The land that my son was going to buy for seventy-five thousand dollars, he was the week before he was buying it, he was walking the flag property line, and found for you old timers like me, Jerry Russo's junkyard was out there. <laughs> there were see, there's some old people here remember it. There were uh, car, frames. car frames, hoods, tires. I think the town had it tested. The woodlot's been cut off. Yeah, we've completed a phase one and phase two on that. We're in the remediation process and we'll be uh, transferring a clean site. Right. So again, out of that 39 acres, I'll give you four acres that's any good. When you go down Alexander Parkway, you're looking at a, a crop, outcrop of ledge that's got to be blown out to get in there. <clears throat> we, my son owns the land on the side of Pepsi. That's how we get out there. We were going to put our construction business out there back in on the 25 acres in the back. And out of the 25 acres, there's 12 acres you can use. Again, you've got wetlands. You've got a berm between, between the gravel plant and the uh, river. On the right hand or the 
east side of the property going north. The state has a right of way coming through there. Um, we tried to buy it, they don't want to sell it. I've been on economic, de economic development since 1997. The only piece of property that been looked at was there was this, the piece next to Pepsi, and that was sold to, um, now it's Woodbury, but it was uh, Midland Sales. My son and his partner bought it off of Midland Sales right there. That's the only piece of property that's any good. When, when again, we dug test holes all over there. We have sold some gravel off of it. Um, KWP estimated 350,000 yards. We probably got 100,000 yards. There's a lot of fill in it. So we're, we're trying to market the fill to get in there. But once we're done, we got a bowl. That's what we got. But back in, in, like I said, in 2002, when my son got the permit, I'm sorry, 2012, when he got the permit to buy the property, I had Eversource out there, and they wanted $80,000 to get an electric line out there with us doing all the work, supplying the pipe, the uh, underground uh, vaults, everything, to put a 6,000-square-foot building up. So that property is not worth And again, I've been on economic development since 1997. Nobody has looked at that 25 acres in the back or the piece of property to the right, just the one that uh, my son owns now that we're on Midland Sales Board. Thank you. Thank you. All right. At this time, um, due to we have to open our special town meeting at 8 o'clock, um, we are going to close the public hearing. So now we will open up. Um, we will call to order the regular town council meeting. It is currently 7.54 p.m. Um, Mr. Wood, if you could open us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we've had uh, some spirited discussion and um, what unites us here right now is uh, this town and you've blessed us by uh, having us be citizens of this town and, and having a love for this town. We just continue to pray that you would unite us in that spirit of being one mind, one heart, uh, where we can debate honestly, uh, agree to disagree sometimes, but ultimately we are all here to uh, do what's best for the town of Killingly. We ask that you continue to guide our discussion. We pray all this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For roll call purposes, all council members are in attendance, Mr. except for Mr. Grandelski, who is absent. Um, with notice. With notice. Uh, moving on in the agenda, item 5A, adoption of minutes of previous meetings, regular town council meeting, July 11, 2023. Can I get a motion to adopt these minutes? So moved. Second. Motion has been made by Mr. Wood, seconded by Ms. George. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. We'll move on to the agenda. Item 6C, I will entertain a motion to table, or excuse me, 6B. 6 6 6A. 6A, we're going to entertain a motion to table. Would you look to just move 7 and A and B up? Up, okay. All right. Yeah, we got five minutes. All right. So I will entertain a motion to move items. 7A and B up on the agenda before item 6. So moved. Second. Second. Motion has been made by Ms. George, seconded by Ms. Wakefield. Uh, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll now move on to items. 7A, unfinished business for town meeting action, consideration and action on an ordinance to authorize a purchase and sale agreement to sell town property at 125 Alexander Parkway to NE Edge LLC. Uh, can I get a motion to uh, adopt this ordinance? So moved. Second. Motion has been made by Mr. Wood, second by Ms. George. Um, Ms. Clory, if you could go over the scan really quick. Selling the property located at 125 um, Alexander Parkway, 39 acres for $5 million. $4,800 to Any Edge LLC. Thank you. 
Um, now at this point we do vote on the setting the ordinance but then it goes to town meeting for the actual vote correct yes okay so those of you just to clarify for council members right now we are not voting on the actual sale we're voting on setting the ordinance to allow this to go to, to the special town meeting at eight o'clock um, for it to be voted on is there any discussion all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. opposed abstentions motion carries unanimously We'll now move on to the agenda. Next item up, 7B, consideration and action on an ordinance authorizing a transfer of up to $746,742 to the established unexpected, unexpended education funds account. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this? So moved. Motion has been made by Ms. Wakefield. Second. Second by Mr. Wood. Um, Ms. Calorio, real quick, this yep. is just transfer? Just a, a request to transfer funds to the non-lapsing fund, which would bring the value of the non-lapsing fund to the $2 million as per the MOU agreement. This is based on their um, audited financials from fiscal year 21-22. Thank you. Uh, discussion? Is this just moving it till 8? Yes. Also? Again, this is just move, uh, passing the ordinance to move this to special town meeting so it can be voted on by the public at 8 o'clock. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Um, back to item 6A. We, I will entertain a motion to table item 6A um, because after, Officer Zemeski is not available this evening. And I'll make that motion to postpone it until September's regular meeting. Thank Second. you. Um, motion made by Mr. Petula, seconded by Ms. George. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. And because of how close we are getting to 8 o'clock, um, we are going to uh, hold off going any further in the agenda due to we're going to be starting the special town meeting in a couple minutes. All right, at this time it is 8 o'clock and we are going to call the special town meeting on items 7A and 7B to order. Gained by the town council 
authorized to enter into the purchase and sale agreement with any Edge LLC of East Greenwich, Rhode Island to purchase real estate as shown in Exhibit A, a 39-acre parcel more or less subject to further delineation as a survey may show, known as 125 Alexander Parkway, Killingly, Connecticut. Be it further ordained that the purchase price shall be $5,004,800, of which $500,000 to be credited to the Economic Development Trust Fund and the remaining funds to be credited to the Capital Project Fund. Ordinance, in ordinance number two, authorizing a transfer up to $746,742 to the established unexpended, unexpended education funds account. Be it ordained that the Town Council of the Town of Kilney that a transfer of up to 746,742 for the fiscal year July 1, 2021 to June 30th, 2022 be transferred to the established unexpended education fund account. Be it for further ordained that the source of said transfer shall be up to 746,742 from the 2021-2022 fiscal year anticipated surplus be transferred to the established unexpended an, an, an education funds account. Be it further ordained that this said transfer be here and submitted to a special town meeting for adoption on August 8, 2023 at 8 p.m. in the town meeting room of the Killingly Town Hall, 172 Main Street, Killingly, Connecticut. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated at Killingly, Connecticut, the 11th day of July, 2023. I now would like to open nominations for moderator of the special town meeting. I'd like to moder uh, make a motion to nominate Mr. Anderson for moderator. Is there a second? Second. Are there any more nominations? Are there any more nominations? Are there any more nominations? Is there a motion to close nominations? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? All, the, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? I'd like to vote on Jason Anderson as moderator of special town meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? I'd like to now turn it over to Jason Anderson. Thank you. Um, at this time, all those who are eligible to vote at the town meeting are registered voters who are U.S. citizens and are at least 18 years of age. Also, those residents who are not registered voters are eligible if they own property assessed at $1,000 or more on the October 1st, 2022 grand list. These eligible voters will have the opportunity to speak or vote on the proposed ordinances. Um, at this time, uh, Ms. Gloria, if you just want to really quick go over items. Um, Do you want me to just start with one? We'll, we're going to we'll take start, one at a time. Yeah, we'll start with 7A first. Um, and then once the discussion is done on 7A, then we'll do a vote on it, and then we'll move on to 7B. So 7A is um, the ordinance to authorize the purchase and sale agreement to sell town property owned at 125 Alexander Parkway to any edge. The sale price of that property is $5,004,800. It is a 39-acre parcel of property located within the industrial park of the, of the property, of the, of the town. Um, uh, I think we've covered a lot of the information through public hearing, but that's uh, the... Uh, the town will receive, um, uh, there is a earnest money that would be deposited. Um, after two years, the town would start receiving $50,000 payments of that earnest money to the town that it would be non-refundable. Um, the uh, purchase and sale agreement does afford a due diligence period that does allow the buyer to um, uh, 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 cancel or uh, re uh, remove themselves from the agreement um, if they deem that they're unable to pursue forward. Um, but at two years, the town does start receiving 50000 that is non-refundable, um, and we receive that 50000 each year um, through that due diligence period. Thank you. Um, at this time, anyone who would like to come and speak to item 7A? Um, I'd like to make a motion to limit public speaking to five minutes uh, per person. I'll second. Okay. We've got a motion made by Mr. Catula, seconded by Ms. George, to limit comments to five minutes per person on each item. I will open up for discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 
Opposed? Abstentions? And just so you know, everyone here can vote on that. That isn't just a council thing because we are in public meeting or special town meeting. Um, okay, so we have a limit of five minutes per person. Anyone who would like to come up and speak to item 7A, which is the sale of the property at 125 Alexander Parkway to any edge, please come up, uh, state your name and address. Um, during this portion, um, as stated earlier, anyone speaking has to be either a registered voter in the town of Killingly, at least 18 years of age, or residents who are not registered voters if they own property assessed at $1,000 or more on the October 1st, 2022 grand list. Uh, Jen, is the mic on for the podium? John LaBelle, 57 Island Road, Deville. I'd like to ask for a clarification of the earnest money. Let's see, the paragraph, well, um, the purchase price, et cetera, adjusted, says adjusted as provided below shall be paid at the closing. Earnest money of $100,000. What's the definition of closing? The closing is when they may, when they exercise the option to purchase the property, which is the signature on the. Is when we when they actually close, not the signature on the purchase and sale, um, uh, but when they actually close on the property, when they actually trigger the option to purchase the property. Just like when you're purchasing uh, a house, say you're purchasing a house, you put a deposit on the house as you go through your due diligence period. You do all your inspections. You um, go through all of that evaluation. And sometimes your closing date gets changed and stuff like that. But you will ultimately come to a closing date. It's not the same date that you signed that initial purchase and sale agreement with your realtor and the day that you put your deposit down on it. It is subsequently when you actually purchase the property and you you know, go to the lawyers or the lawyer sends you the document and you actually close on the property. That's, it's the same transaction. So that's five business days after the effective date of the agreement. Now what's the definition of the effective date of the agreement? The, so the earnest money is required to be deposited to the town within five days of the execution of the purchase and sale that's the deposit that's required to be deposited with the escrow agent which is defined as the issuance of a building permit no that's a different matter the execution of the purchase and sale agreement triggers the requirement for the escrow uh, the the earnest money And I'm confused on state statute. It looks as though it was the building permit issuance. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Would anyone else like to come up and speak? Chloe Markley, uh, 680 Cook Hill Road. I just had a quick question. I was curious if any of you had spoken with the town council in Groton to find out why they decided to shut down their <laughs> negotiations with this company with no comment. Um, my understanding, the town of Groton didn't just shut down um, discussions with this company. They were looking to pass ordinance to not allow any data centers in the city of Groton. So okay. it wasn't this oh. company specifically it was data centers in general in general it wasn't just northeast edge okay all right thank you you're welcome and i'll just add to that that what they decided on was an ordinance that limited the size i think it was twelve thousand five hundred feet yeah. which something that size wouldn't be eligible for the tax incentives from the state Uh, 
So if anyone would like to come up and speak, now's your time. Um, I would like to just address one thing that was made, one comment that was made um, by Mr. Adam Griffiths. He had mentioned the town entering into a purchase and sale agreement with NTE. The town actually never entered into a purchase and sale agreement with NTE because the town wasn't selling any property to NTE. I just want to clarify that. All right, seeing no more comment. Um, at this time, before we move to vote, one thing I would like to do is find out how many people we have in the overflow in the hallway who are eligible to vote. Um, Okay. Oh, just the two. Just the two. Just the two. Okay. Right. All right. And everybody here is the only registered, only eligible voters. Everybody else out there is not. Okay. Okay. So you got everybody in the room. Um, and then down the hallway. Four. Four. Okay. All right. So everybody's in earshot where, um, I should be able to hear everyone when they vote. Okay. Um, one last call for comment. Um, for item seven A. Seeing none, all those in favor of item 7A, the purchase and sale agreement to sell town property at 125 Alexander Parkway to any edge LLC, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. <laughs> okay, I am gonna have to ask for a hand vote on this one. All right, again, I will ask all those in favor, raise your hand. And now I will ask all those opposed, raise your hand. Just ask everyone who's opposed, keep your hands up again. So that is 34, or excuse me, 32 for and 30 against. The motion carries. We'll now move on. Next item up for special town meeting 
is item 7B. Uh, Ms. Calori, could you just go over this, please? Sure. So 7B is for the consideration and action on an ordinance authorizing the transfer of up to $746,742 of unexpended Board of Education funds from the fiscal year 21-22 uh, fiscal year to the established unexpended education funds account. That transfer, uh, typically the Board of Education makes that ask. They did make that request um, at the time of the close of that fiscal year. Um, that comes before the council at the time that the audit is completed. Our audit didn't get complete th this, this year until uh, beginning of June. So it came to the count town council in July for consideration. Um, because of the dollar value, it is required to go to special town meeting for authorization for that transfer to take place. And this would bring, that value would bring the balance of that fund up to the $2 million cap that is in, agree in accordance with the agreement between the town council and the board of education, which uh, caps that uh, uh, account at a $2 million value. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, what was the total surplus from the 21-22 um, board of ed school year? I'm going to look over at Jen Hawkins, but I believe it was about 3.4 million. I could have my number wrong off the top of my head. It's three point. Wait a second, Jen. Can I get you out here? Three million four hundred seventy-nine thirty dollars. Okay. Thank it's, you. It's yep. Oh, you have it. All right, I have ordinance. it in my summary. Yep. Thank yes. you. Okay. I didn't look at the, if I looked at the agenda item, right? Yep. Um, the other question I have um, in the current board of ed budget, did, did the soup didn't the superintendent include three hundred seventy-five million dollars for contingency? which would so no so that was um that had to do with the fact that they utilized or they had authorized the utilization of the non-lapsing fund because they had um only um they had only received one dollar for an increase within the budgetary process but they the board of education decided not to reduce the overall budget down to that level and so they decided to authorize supplemental use of the non-lapsing fund. So within their accounting system, they have to account for that additional revenue and that additional piece. So in order to subtract that out, they had to subtract that out. Not, I'm not talking 21-22 school year. I'm talking yes, the current, the, the the, current school year. Well, 23-22-23, 20, yes. The, the, I'm talking the 23-24 school year that we're in right now. Correct. They had to get reduced out because in the 22-23 year, they allocated or they they authorized the utilization of non-lapsing funds as a stopgap measure should they need should they have needed it in this last budget year um, because they did not lower when they when they approved their total budget for the year after the budget passed they didn't lower it down to that dollar value they lowered it so that way they didn't cut a whole bunch of additional things they lowered it to a value and they used they used the non-lapsing fund. So when they got into the current year, they had to reduce out the utilization of that non-lapsing fund revenue. They didn't end up having to use the non-lapsing fund for that because they do they had enough they had sufficient funds within it, but um, they have been um, looking at additional capital utilization for non-lapsing. Okay. My understanding was like they were using non lapse they're using non lapsing for kitchen equipment for yeah. kitchen equipment. Yeah. yeah, my understanding was the way Mr. Angeli presented it to us and presented it during the Indian town meeting. He was he had an additional three hundred seventy five thousand yeah. listed for contingency because there was actually a line that said I believe it was three hundred seventy five thousand for contingency. It was a it was a reduction. It's the accounting mechanism for it. Um, it can be well. There was a lot of things he didn't explain. It can be clearly. difficult, but yes. Um, but no, that just was an accounting mechanism with regards to how they passed their budget in the previous year. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right. So we already have a motion and a second on this, or no? No. So you need Actually, we do, no. get a motion on the floor. All right. Yep, yeah, motions on the floor. So at this point, no, we need a motion on the floor. You oh. don't have a motion on the floor yet. You just had oh, me explain it. Okay. Yep. Okay. So I will entertain a motion to. So moved. 
adopt Second. the ordinance authorizing the transfer of $746,742 to the established unspended education funds account. Motion was made by Ms. George. I'll second it. Seconded by Mr. Cretula. Um, at this point, anyone who is a registered voter in the town of Killingly over the 18 year, age of 18 years or is a non-registered voter who owns property assessed at $1,000 or more on the October 1st, 22 grand list, um, you can come up to speak to this item. No, you can speak from right there. In regards to um, replenishing the non-lapsing fund, I am not in favor of it. Um, for the school year 22-23, um, it's proposed, um, estimated that there is going to be a $1.6 million returned. For 21-22, it was, what, the $3.4 million. 21-22, um, it was over, over <coughs> $2 million that was, again, returned to um, the town from the Board of Education. So Killingly is a, um, in the Alliance District, which means that despite the Board of Education returning these funds to the town, the um, Board of Education budget cannot be reduced. So they can return five million and their budget stays the same. Their um, budget was increased um, for next year, was it um, by 1.7? million dollars and um, there were less than or about 800 people from the town that voted on this budget uh, the people that showed up at the um, the annual town meeting said that they didn't mind their taxes going up by thirty dollars a month and all I've heard from people in my district is complaints about the taxes going up so I would have been in favor of increasing the um, non-lapsing fund to $2.5 million so that the Board of Education does have $2 million um, non-lapsing fund that can, they can use for anything in any budget shortfalls or anything they need. And um, I, so if you go back for the past nine years, the Board of Education has returned funds to the town of Killingly and their budget keeps going up it cannot it cannot go down because they're in a, we're in an alliance district and i'm speaking from um as a taxpayer and for the people in the third district that have um complained about the taxes going up thank you thank you i've heard a lot of comments myself um people complaining about the increase in taxes and why the board of ed needed that big of an increase um considering they have a $2 million non-lapsing account. Um, and uh, unfortunately, conversations I've had with some of the Board of Ed members, the superintendent, the previous superintendent was misleading them that um, there were restrictions on what the non-lapsing account can be expended on. Um, per the state statute, any money in the unexpended education funds account can be used for anything considered educational purposes which whether that's um, spending money on the kitchen renovations at KMS, whether it's teacher salary, whether it's school supplies, um, <coughs> that money can be used for anything. And unfortunately, uh, our previous superintendent um, misled quite a few members of the Board of Education about that. And I actually had to have conversations with them um, and, and discuss the statute. And this is exactly what the statute says. It can be used for anything educational. Uh, Yate Griffiths Road, couple of questions. Um, the last purchases that were made out of this non-lapsing account, um, this keeps going something that we keep funding with the money that's brought back. Obviously, if it doesn't go to the non-lapsing account, it just goes directly to the town, um, which all the other overflow goes to as well. My question is, what are those capital projects that are being used? Because, like you just mentioned, a lot of the projects that are being used for aren't necessarily things that are an emergency. And being on the council when the original MOU was signed, it wasn't actually written into the state statutes, but it was a 
understanding with that current board that these were to be things that were out of the ordinary, such as we took in more special needs students that year and it went up, an unexpected boiler breakdown. I have to dig up an oil tank and I didn't know it was gone. Something of, of that nature as a capital, capital expense. Um, not something that was necessarily an ordinary expense that you could put in your capital allocation budget and put that out over over your years. I don't know, blue pages of the town, whatever they do in the um, mm -hmm. Board of Ed. But I would just like to know what the last capital, what they took the last money out for. I mean, are these truly capital expenses that need to be funded in this account? So I can give you... Um uh, some information on that um, and I don't have a, a complete list in front of me so I'm going off of memory at the moment um, they're um, replacing the greenhouse roof um, at the high school they did some repaving at one of the lower grade schools um, they replaced uh, they did um, uh, elevator work um, at Westfield, Westfield Avenue um, they're doing, um, uh, why is it failing me? You mentioned the, Flooring. Room, the, the kitchen at the, yeah. the KMS, kitchen at KMS project. Huh? Yeah, sure. Yes, they've done a flooring in a number of, um, other, a number of the facilities. Um, so there's a lot of, um, various capital projects that they've been doing true and most of the ones that you mentioned are ones that you could plan for you know the lifespan of certain equipment you know the lifespan of, of, of certain floors you know the those are kind of hard numbers that we know the lifespan of so and the, it seems the like it's being used as just a uh, an account as an overflow not as its true intention and I understand what the state statute says but what the state statute says versus how much we're going to allocate in that account if you keep just making that account bigger you're just keep going to encourage this type of a spending instead of a budget that actually is reflective on what they need in their yearly operating budget thank you thank you Lois Latch for 64 Island Road. So my question is, um, if this were to vote vote down, where does it, the money goes to the town? The money is already returned to the town from their surplus from the year, yep. um, comes back to the general fund. Then this money would come out of the general fund back into the non-lapsing account. So if this is not approved, it just remains in the general yep. fund, undesignated fund mm -hmm. balance. It just remains there. Yep. So can the town use it? Yes, the town would utilize it and has utilized uh, undesignated uh, the use of fund balance in the uh, um, budgetary process for, like, example, they approved the use of fund balance for the replacement of the library roof and for paving projects and things like that. So it has been used. It's also been used, the town has used fund balance in the past to um, uh, offset operating costs in future years, in, in uh, subsequent budgetary years. <laughs> So our taxes went up because the money was not going back to the town. So how does this affect our, does it affect our taxes at all if we voted this to go back to the town? The, the, it would not affect the current mill rate. The current mill rate's already set because it was based off of the two budgets that passed this year. Yeah. Um, in years past, there have been um, councils who have used some of the general fund to offset um, as Ms. Calorio said, offset increases in expenditures um, to basically reduce the increase of the mill rate mm -hmm. in subsequent years. Is that a possibility? It is always a possibility. A possibility. Okay, that's all, that's all I want to know. <laughs> um, one thing I would like to add, though, is um, one thing I've learned over the years is bond rating agencies, if you're constantly using general fund to offset operational costs right. um, it can affect our bond rating is the one downfall to doing that and that was one of the reasons why during this last budgetary process i actually advised the council against utilizing a fund balance for offsetting operational because we were getting ready to go out for debt issuance and that is something that the credit rating agencies look very strongly at as to whether or not you're using your reserve funds to offset operational costs or if you're using your reserve funds 
to invest in capital projects. And so they opted to utilize those reserve funds for investing in capital and, and not, and we performed very well in our credit rating. We maintained our AA plus uh, stable outlook, which is really outstanding for Killingly. So um, it performed very well. Thank you. No, I'm Ferrin, uh, 102 Squaw Rock Road, and I'm also the, uh, currently the chair of the uh, Killingly Board of Education. And I'd just like to uh, let the public know, I mean, there's been some misinformation put out here. Um, the, re the reason that there have been budget surpluses is because we've had staffing shortages. That's the only reason there's been budget surpluses. And we've been trying to get that point across to this town council for over a year and it, it just never seems to, to, to sink in. Every, every if every position we had um, for, the, for the Board of Education, every position was filled, we would use up the entire budget, and that's how you're supposed to budget. Um, you know, this hijacking of excess uh, funds from the Board of Ed and using it for town projects, I think, is disgraceful, and it, it keeps happening. And, you know, I hope the voters support the kids, support the schools, and realize that this idea of a budget surplus is just, it's a fantasy. If we fill all positions this year, there will be no budget surplus. So a $2 million um, fund that we agreed to um, a couple of years ago now um, is, is a buffer to prevent us going over budget. And if we do go over budget, we're going to have some issues. So that's basically what I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, just to refer back to like the state legislature, when the state first started looking at implementing the uh, unexpended education funds, as it was brought up before, um, there were issues where the state wasn't funding all of the special education grants, and there were shortfalls. And when that happened, um, at that point, the town had to go and do a supplemental appropriation um, to cover that money. Um, supplemental appropriation does two things. A, taxpayers get a supplemental tax bill um, that you weren't, you weren't planning on, weren't expecting. The other thing is it can also affect your bond rating and considering the projects we're going out to bond. Um, so we never issued supplemental tax bills. That's not what a supplemental appropriation well, does and I'm going to just kind of interject there. Right, so right, I'm going to interject there. So it doesn't, what it does manager. do is, so a supplemental appropriation means that you're utilizing fund balance in the mid-year of a, of a tax year. Um, it's the activation of fund balance. And it does do two things. Number one, it increases the, um, what, what, what ended up being the challenge was the state changed the baseline funding requirements for boards of education. It used to be the minimum budget requirement was based off of what their previous, used to be their minimum expenditure requirement. So what they expended in the previous year had to be what we budgeted in the, in the in the subsequent year. They changed that formulation to the minimum budget requirement, which meant what you budgeted in the previous year, you had to budget again in the subsequent year. Otherwise, you jeopardized your funding for the ECS funding. So if you budgeted a dollar less of funding to the Board of Education, you lost two dollars of ECS grant funding, mm -hmm. right? That was the penalty. So that was the first change that the state made, was going from minimum expenditure requirement to a manager minimum budget requirement. And when they did that, that changed the town council and the Board of Education had an agreed, agreed upon procedure. In the middle of the year, the Board of Education would come to the town with uh, an outlook as to where their special education costs were falling. If they felt that they were, if, if it was, the, the outlook was that the uh, special education costs were going to be exceeding their special education cost budget, they would put forward a request for, su for supplemental appropriations due to that special education cost. With the understanding that they would try their utmost to return all of that money at the end of the year. Again, it didn't impact our budgetary process because at the state level, the requirement was a minimum expenditure requirement, right? When the state changed that, now once we started doing those supplemental appropriations mid-cycle, that increased their budget for the year. 
So now that increased budget was now the new number that the town had to meet the threshold on in the subsequent year, which changed the level of funding requirement from the town that the town was agreeing to on an annual basis. It, it increased that. Sec secondly, we did start to receive, we actually got a downgrade from the, our credit rating agency because we were doing consistent mid-year supplemental appropriations for operational purposes in the middle of the year. That's frowned upon by the credit rating agencies. You're, they basically say, you're not budgeting properly. You need to do your budgeting better. And so the town council at the time and the Board of Education came together and evaluated how the Board of Education was going through their budgetary, budgetary process. What the Board of Education was previously doing was they were taking, <clears throat> um, they were taking um, a historical look back and doing averages on that and not necessarily being able to take a forward projection look forward on what they were estimating their forward projection special education. It's a really hard number to forward project because a child can land in your school district, you know, day two of the school year well after your budget is passed. That could be a $100,000 expense to the, to the school district. Um, and it can be a very challenging thing. So that is really the 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 two ways that that supplemental appropriation impacted the town and that's why we moved away from that at the same time is when this legislation started coming into play at the state level the state put the special legislation put this legislation into play really largely around allowing districts to be able to mitigate smooth out those impacts plan have have a, have a reserve account, if you will, to be able to manage those unforeseen special education um, uh, costs that may arrive in their community mid-cycle, mid-year that nobody saw or planned for. But the way the language in the statute was written, it was written very broadly. It was written that all educational purposes, which meant capital projects. And to echo what Adam had said during that uh, conversation with the town council when this was being negotiated, the town council and the board of education at the time did want to really utilize or or um, look at utilizing or activating that account for those capital emergencies that may arise and or those um, special education emergencies that may arise. But that being said, the um, statute does allow for the utilization of that fund for any educational cost. But that's really what your supplemental appropriation does to the town mid-cycle, and that's why we got away from it. There was a lot of changes at the state level between what drives the town requirement for budgetary purposes and what how we get penalized for that. So, And just to clarify, the MOU the town has with the Board of Ed um, it does not specify how the funds get expended, what they get expended on, and the Board of Ed does not have to come to the council for approval to expend any of those funds. The only thing in the MOU is the percentage of a budget surplus, a percentage of their current budget that can be um, added to the uh, unexpended account um, and what the cap on the unexpended account is. I have to agree with Ula. I think we have to ask ourselves, um, so with a 1.7 mil million increase and all the funds that are, that are coming back from the Board of Education fund, um, do we really think we're gonna utilize that? Because understand that, that, that budget can never go back down and we're paying for that. So we really have to, really have to understand the monies that have gone back from the Board of Education that our taxpayers have paid for. And sometimes it, it has to stop. When's enough enough? Right? That's what we're here for. We're here to control the money. When's enough enough? And what's the realization that we're going to fill all these positions given the economy right now? If, if I may, uh, Thank you. Chairman, yep. I just want to clarify that this, um, this transfer does not impact the minimum budget requirement. For next year has no impact on that so the minimum budget calculation requirement does not come into play on this this is simply transferring funds into that reserve account i just want to clarify that for everyone in the room mm -hmm. 
I threw that number. I threw that word around quite a bit. <clears throat> Any other comments? I just have some clarifying questions. So, in in the uh, non-lapsing right now is like one point two million or something. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, and if we were to put this in a general fund, we couldn't uh, use it for the milled rate till next year. It affects nothing this year. Correct. It was not utilized for budgetary purposes. Uh, just want to clarify, uh, if we were to pay a debt service loan, that's an operating cost, so we can't really do it. Correct. Um, and then the last... Well, so to be clear... Yeah. You could do it, but it's considered Penalty. an operating, yeah. and the credit rating agency would 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 uh, take note of that. And that, and I would wonder how does that affect our cap? Like, don't we have a spending cap like six point one? Correct. Well, so and it depends on the year for that spending cap and what that the yeah. calculation is that changes year to year. So my last question is, um, do we because uh, we have some board of ed here and uh, some administration? Do we have any kind of historical? idea of special ed shortfalls in the in the past few years does anybody know just estimates and by shortfalls you're talking how much less the state funded than what was anti what was budgeted for what was anticipated No, I'm talking about past historically. Yeah, historically, uh, previous years. I, I'm not sure. I think this year it was pretty close to what was budgeted, but I'm not positive. Um, but, I, you know, I, I was thinking of a, a couple other things as I was sitting there about this, um, the, the uh, Board of Ed budget. So just mic so on. everybody understands there was a zero. Jen, is the podium mic on? Testing. Right, Just so everybody knows, there was a 0% uh, increase uh, the year before. So I don't know how many of you have uh, bought things lately, but to the idea that you don't get a raise, um, your bud does, budget doesn't go up um, for two years in a row, um, doesn't face any kind of reality. And um, the budget um, surplus this year is dramatically less than it was last year because we wound up filling a lot of positions and there, we have a job fair coming up there's positions being filled constantly um, so you know the idea that they're not going to be filled it, is every single position going to be filled probably not but we're going to have a much I, would, I, I predict a much smaller budget deficit this year um, this coming year than we've had this past school year so um, and and this money you know I mean if it doesn't get restored to the amount the two million dollars that was agreed to it's just going to be spent by the town on something else so I think having a safety net for a 47 million dollar budget of two million dollars is not excessive and if you see how fast some of these projects can use up funds um, and keep in mind that a lot of the reason for the tax increase was um, capital projects that were were approved by the voters. So, you know, the idea that you know you want to circumvent the voters and, and change their vote on the school budget, and also capital projects is you know kind of it, it's not forward looking, and it and, and I don't think it's right. Thank you. So my question here is, are we rehashing the budget that was already passed, or are we discussing the non-lapsing account? Because that seems like we keep rehashing the budget that's already been passed. I'm not here to fight that. I'm here to go with the item that's on the agenda. Mary, question for you. Um, so that's 700000 plus that's talked about going in back into the non-lapsing account. Could, in essence, that drop down the mill rate next year? In next year's budget so the town council could activate the utilization of fund balance um, and if that you know uh, if this isn't transferred into the non-lapsing it would be available within fund balance so it is possible and Correct. one, one other question authority. so what was the what was the Board of Education give back last year in last year's budget 
uh, I don't have that number yet for the 22-23 number yet. It's, uh, What's the estimated? I think they're estimated is about 1.6. Um, I haven't, uh, we haven't closed, we haven't gotten close out numbers yet. Okay. It's and the year early. before was? Uh, 3.4. 3.4. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Any further comments? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor of authorizing the transfer of up to of $746,742 to the established unexpended education funds account say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Nay. The ayes have it. <coughs> we'll now move on on the agenda. Um, next item up because uh, we are actually ending the special town meeting. You have to call for adjournment of the special town so meeting. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the special town meeting. I'll make a motion to adjourn the special town meeting. Second. Okay. Motion has been made by Mr. Catula, seconded by Ms. Wakefield. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The special town meeting is adjourned. Um, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to take a five-minute recess. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. A uh, motion has been made by Mr. Wood, seconded by Mr. Cartula. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? This meeting is going into recess. We will return from recess in five minutes at 8.52.
This is Jason Anderson, Chairman of Killing Town Council, and we are back from recess. Um, at this time, we're moving on the agenda to item 6B, presentation by CPD Killingly LLC for an easement at 580 Hartford Pike. Six. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. There we go. <laughs> Hi, uh, sorry. Uh, good evening. Again, good evening. For the record, my name is Kevin Soley. I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of Connecticut with Soley Engineering. I'm um, here tonight to talk about uh, a project at uh, 536, 542, and 552 Hartford Pike in Killingly, Connecticut. Um, and actually, uh, a request for the council to approve uh, the issuance of a uh, uh, granting an easement to, a, to benefit a commercial property at those addresses over um, uh, uh, over 580, sorry, Hartford Pike. Um, so uh, we have been working on this project for quite some time. I think um, we, we've been working with uh, town leadership. We've been going through the planning and zoning process. We've met with parks. Um, what we're proposing is the construction of a commercial building um, at those three addresses I mentioned before. Um, we were, in order to, to really uh, provide um, safe and adequate access, what we we're proposing to do is to construct a driveway um, across 580 Hartford Park Pike, which is the Owen Bell Park. Um, and we're proposing to uh, manage that access through a proposed easement, actually a series of easements. We're proposing um, a few easements. And if you can go to the next slide, please. Well, this actually, this aerial just kind of shows and provides some orientation onto where the project's located. So Hartford Pike is runs uh, east-west uh, along the page. Owen Bell Park is to the northeast of our proposed site. Uh, next slide. Um, and this map depicts the proposed easement that we are uh, requesting um, uh, for consideration. It's a 35-foot wide access easement in favor of CPD Killingly LLC and a 20-foot wide uh, sanitary easement in favor of CPD Killingly LLC. And those would allow for the uh, ability for vehicles and pedestrians to pass and repass over um, a driveway, which would then connect into um, Town Farm Road, which would provide you know, safe vehicular access at the traffic signal at Town Farm Road and um, Harford Pike. Um, additionally, there's actually some drainage, which currently conveys through the subject parcels from the park, um, which is just, uh, which isn't really established or prescribed in an actual easement. So part of this is also um, granting an easement benefiting the town of Killingly to allow for that continued drainage to pass through those properties. And we've been able to design that and incorporate that into the design of our proposed development. Um, so as I mentioned, we've been going through a very extensive review process with the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, I believe we've satisfied all of the town engineering comments. We are submitted to the health, the uh, WPCA, the water company, the DOT, and we're going through all the necessary steps to, to, to bring what we consider a very exciting project to the town. Um, you know, we have some, uh, so, you know, I think with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the, the council may have. If, if I may, just to review very briefly, um, the group did present to the um, Board of Recreation um, and reviewed the uh, proposed easement area um, and the safety precautions that we were looking to install. They, we would be would be installing with uh, this easement. Um, so the current um, entrance at Owen Bell, once you come off a of town farm road and come to that first stop sign, currently there is only one stop sign. Um, that um, just stops the traffic entering the area. This would develop that into a four-way intersection. Um, it also um, creates the entrance into the upper parking lot um, there of Owen Bell into a um, <clears throat> more established driveway entrance as opposed to such a large um, um, area. It um, makes it more of a more direct to drive. So we did, you know, staff level, we um, brought to them a number of our, you know, clearly, you know, this is an entrance way of our park. We brought a number of safety concerns that we had with regards to pedestrian access. 
and um, pedestrian movement. The Board of Recreation, um, in their request, they had requested a sidewalk be added um, to the easement, to the construction of the roadway, so that way those that may be utilizing the park, if they decided to walk over to these establishments, they would have safe pedestrian access to that. Um, the developer was uh, amenable to that and added that into the project, so they did uh, incorporate that. The Board of Recreation unanimously supported um, this and recommended it to the Town Council um, for, um, for approval and consideration. So um, they did go through that step. Planning and Zoning also performed their full 824 review. They are also um, he's, he was talking about their um, planning and zoning process for the actual development, but planning and zoning did the, do the 824 review by, by statutory requirements with regards to the easement itself, and they did approve that 824 in their review. So they did um, complete that process as well. Um, and again, had very similar concerns around pedestrian movement, um, which uh, the, the group was willing to uh, satisfy and walked through all of those with us. Thank you. Uh, any comments, questions from council? So I have a few questions here. Um, looking at, you know, what you're planning on developing, uh, I noticed that you know, obviously there's a couple houses here already. Um, how is that going to impact those residents or if those are actually even being occupied right now? Well, um, the owners of the parcels are, are in turn through an agreement to, to sell okay. the, the, the parcels to our client, the developer. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I believe any tenants that may be there are, are renting. I believe it's on a month to month agreement. Um, and, and obviously in order to, to develop the property, those, uh, you know, those houses will be torn down. Right. Um, one of the things that we did do um, after our planning and zoning meeting um, was our latest plans. We actually provided a pretty uh, much healthier buffer mm -hmm. to some of the residents to the north and to the uh, west. Um, we added some landscaping through there to try to really kind of maximize and, and really um, you know, minimize any potential uh, uh, impacts to the to the surrounding residents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the, the project itself it's, it satisfies zoning requirements in terms of coverage and, and things like that. So um, we believe it's been designed in accordance with uh, zoning regulations. Okay, um, and that was, that was those actually going to be my next question there. Considering I'm again looking at the aerial map, um, there's one property uh, off to the uh, west of it that. Um, you know, that was my was going to be my question. Is there a fence or some kind of, you know, something so that way they continue to maintain their privacy as well? Because mm -hmm. uh, it looks like they, they have a pretty good uh, area with trees and stuff covering. So um, my only other question, uh, and this might be a better question for Bucky or for Mary, um, when it comes to the uh, fireworks and when we have that, obviously that's our largest event there. Mm -hmm. um, how is that going to, if, with this, how is that going to impact that? So really, if anything, it actually provides more parking. <laughs> Fair enough. <Truthfully. laughs> um, so we close off really the park. And this year we really uh, took a different approach and we closed off the whole uh, lower parking lot completely mm -hmm. uh, and the upper parking lot. We only utilized uh, the um, small overflow parking lot for handicapped only parking, um, which I think worked out very well. By and large, the most people that come to that event park in the <coughs> commons or other establishments, Bell Park right. Realty, and they walk over, right? So, um, you know, um, that's really, um, you know, if anything, it provides additional space for that parking. Um, our law enforcement, you know, um, we have control mechanisms in place on how we exit vehicles out of that and how we exit people out of that, out of that space. So, you know, we go through that whole project planning and how we manage that. Um, we have currently the bank parking lot is right there as well that we have to manage the people that park in there during that event mm -hmm. as well. So it's, it's, you know, it's like any other business along there. Um, Berkshire Bank has people that are parking in, that, in their lot. Um, the medical facility has people parking in their lot. So we just, um, we uh, assess how many uh, vehicles we expect to come from those lots and how they may exit. This one actually, they're not gonna funnel in they're not going to funnel back 
to Town Farm Road, though, because there's exit pathways onto 101. So we could right. very easily say that property exits right hand only out of the right onto 101. So the exit portion of this is not solely for the ease from the easement, right? Mm -hmm. um, this really the easement is really allows that exit portion for um, what I would consider are you know the day-to-day -day when we have high traffic points on 101 when somebody is trying to exit out of this facility and wants to take a left-hand turn onto 101 it's really close to the killing the commons traffic light right. and um this would allow somebody to then get to a to a signal um to be able to safely take that left as opposed to trying to navigate the heavy traffic in both directions um, and provide that safety. So, um, you know, yes, is it going to provide more traffic um, in through that area? It is, but all the volume from this facility isn't going to go through that. It's not their only in, and it's not their primary access and exit points for the for the development. Correct. Yeah, that was that was really just my concern. Is um, you know, considering the high foot traffic we get for the. Um, for the fireworks there, I, I wanted to make sure that obviously the biggest thing is our people are safe and uh, with that easement there, that's where my concern came in. But they will be busy. Oh, I, and our constabulary will be very busy too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, considering that 101 is a state highway, uh, I'm assuming that DOT already approved. So the yeah, so we've, we've submitted to the DOT to start the encroachment permit review. Um, their practice is they won't issue their final permit until the local uh, planning and zoning commission has acted but we have submitted to them um, for the work within the right of way the access driveway and they look at it from a, uh, a high level to make sure that there's you know traffic's managed um, so we've started that process with them um, and you know we aren't expecting any issues with them but we'll certainly satisfy all the requirements all right. that was my question I, I have one question how far away is the building from the beginning of the park property? Um, uh, I, don't think I, I don't have an exact measurement, but I would actually, you know, I do. I believe it's about nine, approximately 90 feet. 90 feet? 90. From the actual park entrance. Oh, from the park entrance. Oh, that, I'm sorry. So I just meant the from, the, from the property line. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I know. I mean the building from the property. From oh, the property line. From the property line, I believe it's approximately 90 feet. From, from here. Yeah. What you're asking? From the from the building to where the park property begins to here. Yeah. To this line. Okay. Yeah. Just feet. making sure okay. I understood. <clears throat> Actually, if you go to the next slide, there may be a uh, dimension. It may not be 90, it may be 60. And it's kind of hard to see. Um, I, believe it's, I believe it's 60 feet. Yeah. That, was, that was just because they were, their concern was that um, a liquor establishment wouldn't go into the um, the development and my concern was that um, a marijuana dispensary couldn't go in because but it has to be 500 feet minimum and up to 1500 so that was my concern right, right. The, the, the the current leasing plan doesn't include any um, liquor stores or dispensaries right thank you any other questions who's the developer um, uh, Dominic Carpionato where they are? Uh, Newtown, Connecticut. Newtown. I just want to say thank you for the sidewalks. <laughs> <laughs> the, only, <laughs> the only concern, and, I, and I'm not a big person for sidewalks everywhere, but this was really important. The only que the only concern I had with this was the the kids going from you know Owen Bell to run over to grab a burger or something. And that's going to be a high traffic area. So the sidewalks, I'm really happy. You guys thought of that, right? We actually Bravo. provided, and we actually added some additional sidewalks. You can see, you know, so we had a sidewalk coming out of the facility and then going along the drive itself yeah. to the entrance of the, of the parking lot. But we also provided a, another uh, driveway kind of directly to right where the skate park is. Yeah. So Sorry. we have it yeah. have it tee off there so that there's more than adequate, right. you know, that's what I was safe looking passage. At. I was like, oh, good. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Yep. 
Any further questions? Um, I have. I have one question. I um, received a complaint that it's encroaching on the historic district. So how close is it actually to the historic district? So it's, um, uh, there was a, my understanding is that there was a uh, house on the property um, that was, uh, I guess, uh, recognized as, as historic, but that house was, was torn down. Um, some time ago, well before our client, um, you know, started his project. It's been down for a long time. So um, uh, there's nothing, there's no historic nature, and I think we're actually outside. There's nothing on the properties that we're proposing that are historic. Um, there was one before, but it's, it's since been torn down for quite some time. Well, There's I think no what we did to, to, to address that is really try to kind of beef up and expand the landscape uh, plan and really provide some sufficient, you know, more than adequate buffers and, and really kind of provide some really good aesthetic for that. And I think someone else may have a comment. <laughs> no? Yeah. During your presentation, no. It's up to you guys. So Anne Marie is our planning and zoning director. Yeah. If you have any questions for her, you can ask the questions if you yeah. so desire, but it's an option. Jen, podium mic, please. Jen. <laughs> okay. Um, we did check into that. It was the building itself that, ha that hit the historical registry. It's not the ground. It's the building. Um, we have talked to the developer. There's negotiations on, you know, maybe putting some sort of plaque to designate it. But it's more of the person who lived in that house that's no longer there and the style of that house and the house is no longer there. So once that goes, that kind of goes away. So um, they're allowed to do what they want to do on that as far as that is concerned is historically. Um, so that's the big answer. Once the house went, that went away. Thank you. I apologize. I had to take care of a family emergency. Um, one of the, one of the things you know, I, I've gotten com comments about you know traffic. Oh, it was a lot of traffic. I grew up on 101. My parents' house was literally like 100 feet down from this. Um, I learned to back my little Chevette in real real fast because those cars came along real fast, and that was back in the 80s. Um, it's it's a little bit more intense. Um, I know, I know everybody, there were concerns because of having to come downtown farm and that, but there's n absolutely no way you're going to make a, like a four lane crossover going, coming out that bottom to go that way, you know, going towards the main Go commercials on. that there's now, frankly, I think it's easier for me to get home when I go the other way. So I go the other, over the tracks because then I don't have to go through that intersections, but, um, the, uh, the other thing, um, so anyways, when it came to the track, I started thinking when, I know the DOT's in charge of traffic studies, but were you planning on like spacing them out like after a, a, an event or on a weekend versus a weekday, week, week um, morning traffic versus afternoon traffic? So in terms of a traffic study? Yeah. So we did, we did prepare a traffic study and what we looked at actually was the, um, uh, the, the p.m. peak hour and the Saturday peak hour, okay. which are the, the peak periods of the, like the ambient street traffic. Mm -hmm. And then it also represents the most conservative analysis from when our trip generation would, would be at its highest and yep. put on the roadway. So we analyzed, you know, the signalized, inter we actually analyzed uh, seven signalized intersections throughout, or six signalized intersections throughout the corridor. Mm -hmm. And we presented that to planning and zoning and that study is also being reviewed by the DOT as well. Okay. Um, so we needed to ensure that our proposed development wouldn't have any adverse impact on traffic so that we could make sure that we were, um, you know, we had you know, safe vehicular access to, to patrons and everyone else was on the road. I, I mean, I, right now, the, those three, that, that whole area is just overgrown and, and it's really, I mean, another eyesore in the Davel section. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of excited because, you know, it's instead of now them now having to cross 101 to get across to the other restaurants and stuff, um, they'll be right there. Right. It'll be something that they can just, there'll be sidewalks, they'll be available. Um, and you know, 
bring in more anytime you can bring more people into into town um, yeah. and we are and Owen Bell is is one of our our prize <coughs> parks so thank you thank you any more questions do you have anything further for us? No, I just, you know, again, we, we appreciate the um, Council's commission or consideration. Um, you know, thank you for working with us through this process, and we're excited to, to bring this project to fruition. Okay. Thank you thank for you. your time. Thank you. We'll now move on in the agenda. Next item up is item eight, citizen statements and petitions. Ms. Gloria, did we have anything submitted? We did not have any submitted for the meeting. Uh, if anyone would like to come up and speak to anything, um, now would be the time to come up to the podium. State your name and address. Oh, no, not him again. John LaBelle, 57 Island Road. Nice professional. Presentation, I loved it. Thank you. Very, very well done. Um, in seeing this, I have two questions. One is, um, what are we doing about the empty stores in town? In terms of vision, across the street from where this is being proposed, uh, there are. There are four or five empty stores. If you go up to where the old AMP was, there are a number of empty stores there. Uh, if we've got a developer from Newtown who takes an interest in this community, wow, they're going a ways to develop. So it, it tells me there's an interest in this town uh, to do that. So that's that's one uh, one point I have, and uh, I think you've addressed it is safety for the children in a park. Um, thank you. Thank you. Any more public comment? Last call for public comment. <coughs> Seeing no more public comment, we'll move on in the agenda. Next item up is item nine council and staff comments um, now Ms. Calorio um, does the town work with companies who have say a mall with open spaces to try and bring in um, sure we um, we, in general, you know, as um, developers or, you know, potential um, businesses or look to locate within the community, um, our economic development director meets with them and tries to connect them with what might meet their um, criteria for their business needs. Um, some of our spaces in some of our um, uh, commercial plazas, um, there are... Um, compete clauses within leases that restrict what uh, businesses potentially can locate within them. Um, that's just uh, a nature within that individ mm -hmm. those individual plazas, and, and that's something that they have to deal with. But we do work with um, any and all businesses and developers that come in um, with regards to, um, you know, trying to look at infilling um, is existing spaces that may meet those, uh, the criterias of um, of the businesses that are looking to locate, but ultimately, you know, if it, it you know if it's in the best interest for that development that they are looking to build and they have accessible land to do so, that you know sometimes that does make the most sense for the clientele they're looking to serve as far as tenants. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Wood. And really, I mean, especially since we brought on Jill, um, we've been doing phenomenal with bringing business to town. I know, I know. We sometimes it is discouraging when we see the uh, empty storefronts and things like that. But when you see what's actually been happening, man, it's been amazing. 
uh, the, the multiple um, business openings and things like that. And not every space is perfect for every business. You know, obviously it's got to be that perfect marriage together. Um, and it's not just Jill too. I mean, we have a fantastic town staff has been making Killingly very well marketable. Um, and uh, you know, being fiscally responsible too. There, you know, they businesses know they can come here and conduct business. Um, well, you know, outside of what the state of Connecticut's doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I gotta say we, we're doing as a town overall. Um, sometimes it doesn't seem it, but we're really actually doing a great job with uh, bringing in business. I agree. Um, as the liaison for economic development, um, both the members on that on that um, commission are very, very <coughs> active, um, very, very involved. Um, I know Bill Chang um, has been really involved with the real estate. You know, a couple of couple of them have been very involved. And when uh, back in June, when they had that their regional meeting here, they actually toured the Thai building. And for years, we tried to get the Thai building. We couldn't get the Thai building. We finally got the Thai building and then it was all the hurdles we went through trying to develop. Whoever's in there now, they, they took a tour of what that's already been done and they got, you know, they got some nibbles. They actually got potential um, tenants that might be interested in coming in. Just because we brought them he, you know, here, we hosted them, we showed them a building that we're working on and these are our plans and they got excited. So I mean, yeah, I absolutely agree with you guys. I, we have a really good team that, that's working to, to fill what we've got. I mean, we've got a beautiful town. We've got a historic town. And yeah, we do have some nice historic districts and, and they're working on repairing. I mean, the Historic District Commission did a great job creating those pamphlets and filling their own commission. Um, they've got people that are excited about restoring their, their, their older houses. and. Um, so I, I just, you know, there's a lot of good stuff coming down the pike and killing away, so. Thank you. Any more comments? Seeing none, we'll move on in the agenda. Next item up is item 10A, appointments to boards and commissions. Karina Torrey is seeking a reappointment to the Inland Wetlands Water Course Commission. Her term would run from May 5th, 2023 through April 30th, 2026. Ms. Torrey has attended every meeting in the past year. In the Wetlands Water Course Commission has two alternate member vacancies. Um, can I get a motion to reappoint Ms. Torrey? So moved. I'll second it. I'll second it. Uh, motion was made by Ms. George, seconded by Mr. Cotula. Uh, I will open up for discussion. Um, it's always great to see those who do come forward and volunteer for our boards and commissions, um, especially ones who look to continue on and have spent the time already and have the um, knowledge and expertise that goes with it previously serving. Any more comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on in the agenda. Next item up is reports from liaisons. I do not see a board of ed liaison. And, yep, and Burr doesn't meet over the summer. So we'll move on to the next item, item 12A, discussion and acceptance of monthly budget reports. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt the summary report on general fund appropriations for town government? So moved. Second. Motion has been made by Mr. Wood, seconded by Ms. Barclay. Uh, discussion? Questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on in the agenda. Yep. Um, next item up, we did not receive a... There is none because they don't meet over yep. the summer. We did not receive a uh, budget from the Board of Ed. 
Um, so we'll move on to 13A, Correspondence Communications Reports. Uh, Ms. Caloria, could you go over the town manager's report? Um, sure. So the um, bond issuance, I just wanted to give you an update. We did successfully sell $7, millions in bond, $7 million in bonds on June 29th. Um, we attracted really good interest, a good amount of interest in that sale. We had 10 bidders on our sale, which is a really good number of bidders for, um, for our sale of $7 million. Um, and that's really attributed to three, really three strong factors, killingly strong financial performance, um, <clears throat> the long-term planning in place that, you know, this council and previous councils have um, stayed true to and the community has straight, stayed true to over the years, and our strong credit standing. Um, and those two previous factors played a lot into that. Um, into, you know, play wholeheartedly into that strong credit standing. So Bancroft Capital had the lowest interest cost of 3.317 and change percent. Um, so that is uh, the interest cost. Um, we received our final uh, payment schedules. And for the current fiscal year, we actually have a budgetary savings of $84,000 um, from that. So we really did perform very well in the interest um, department on on that sale um, we weren't expecting to come in as low as that within our with the interest so um, it performed very very well so um, very good to the town for that um, an update on the Reynolds Street project we did uh, receive bids on that um, we received four bids PJF is the lowest responsive bidder for the project um, <coughs> The total project is a um, little over 851000 which is um, within the budgeted funds allocated within the ARPA funds to complete the project. Um, <clears throat> final paving for this, so paving for this is not included within this project. It's in town aid road money, so it's outside. It's within the pavement management plan. Um, PJF has already indicated to us the earliest that we can receive the box culvert because the box culvert has to be manufactured specifically for this project um, uh, the earliest we can get it is December so um, it'll depend on the winter right as to whether or not we're gonna crack open a road in the middle of you know in December or January and get underway likely we're gonna not start until the spring right so we really got to kind of walk through that um, we don't want to get into a bunch of cold weather work if um, and keeping the road open. So I'll keep you guys updated as we go through that, but that's really kind of where we're going to be at, um, which means, you know, um, we're going to be prepping for some of that interruption to um, activities at Davis Park um, for the upcoming construction cycle. Um, but that will, we've been in a lot of regular communications with Connecticut Water because Connecticut Water is looking to replace their water main in that section. So hopefully we'll be able to time well with them and they'll be able to replace um, their water main at the same time as this project. So um, final paving can be final paving um, and we don't run into any of that. Library roof, um, we have been um, really rolling through the preparations of getting that project out to bid. We've done a lot of um, initial testing on that roof. Um, for evaluating grades, um, you know, <clears throat> code has changed with regards to insulation thicknesses. Um, it is a um, flat membrane roof, so uh, there are skylights. We have to be cognizant of, you know, what's the new thickness requirement for insulation and the depth of the skylight and whether or not all of that is going to jive. So they've been, engineering has been working very closely with that, making sure that we're meeting current code standards. They've done core sampling and hazardous material testing. So we have a fully um, developed plan going out to um, uh, issuing the bid documents. I'm expecting those bid documents to hit the streets within the next two weeks. Um, we anticipate we'll still like, we, we still should be able to get that roof work complete before winter. So that will be good because we do still have some leaks that are occurring in that roof um, and we um, patch it, but you know, uh, it's definitely met its useful life, so it's time to get it done. Uh, Soap Street. We officially own Soap Street. 26 Soap Street is officially the town owned. Uh, we've begun our design phase on that renovation. Um, so the design phase, as we discussed before, was includes hardening that exterior, making sure that the windows and the doors are hardened for security purposes. Access, um, controlled access is uh, installed. We do have to do some minor parking lot drainage improvements. We have to do some 
um, um, re- renovations to the bathroom and the locker room um, area. <clears throat> we are working with um, Novus Insight and um, our and Fiber for fiber installation to bring the CEN network, which is our fiber network that we have to that property. It is not that far away, so we will be able to get it into that property pretty, you know, pretty reasonably. Um, we're waiting to get some um, final information from them, but the fiber installation has to occur, and we are working on getting the installation of a blue phone um, on the exterior because that has been a concern in making sure that we have, in case somebody were to arrive at that location, that they do have the ability to call somebody. So. Um, we're going through that evaluation process. Um, the Whatever work we can do in-house um, to mitigate costs, that's what we're doing. So a lot of the, uh, uh, the drainage and the parking lot work, we're going to be able to pretty much do that in-house. We'll, we'll get that wrapped up. Um, even some of the interior renovation stuff, we can get wrapped up internally with our own staff. We're not likely going to have to contract out for everything. So um, fiber connection, we'll be contracting for <laughs> We're not going to be running that one. But um, as we go through, um, if we need to put out a bid package, we will. But um, we expect that we'll be um, well within budget on on that project. Um, and then lastly, just wanted to let you know, you know, the last five years. So CTCMA is the Connecticut Town and City Manager Association. It's my professional Managers Association for the State of Connecticut. It's the Connecticut Division of the National Organization of City Managers. Um, I've been the treasurer of that organization for the last five years. Um, they decided to make me president for the year. So I'm the president. Yeah, right? Um, so I'm the president for this year, which really, you know, I've, I'll be segueing off my treasurer duties uh, to another member um, in the state um tomorrow actually and then um we i i assist in basically coordinating our quarterly meetings we have a we have one annual meeting and then um i will be attending virtually some coordination meetings with um our regional representation for all of the uh new england state presidents of manager associations and um really reaching out to newly appointed managers and um, town uh, administrators across the state. So that's really what my role is going to be for this coming year. Thank you. And then I did list the meetings that I've been to. Clearly this month I had far less meetings that I attended because I did go on vacation. It was a great vacation. Um, <laughs> I survived, <laughs> and um, it was great. So I I appreciate that. It was great. Um, I have one question, something that was actually brought up to me just before tonight's meeting. Um, regarding the software we're going to implement to put the general ledger online, what's the status of that? Yeah, so, um, you know, we've been trying to focus on making sure we got audit out the door. Um, so we have been in communication with them now we've got an audit out the door budgets completed so we'll be starting to refocus and see about um uh, what our um implementation time frame would be for that i'm not sure where they can slate us in at this point in time because we did um have to delay that in order for us to be able to prioritize audit to get it out the door okay so um, no estimated time. I don't have an estimate, and I don't want to give you an estimated time and have it be wrong. So um, I'll get that, and I'll report out at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Sure. Just real quick, I know you mentioned this um, with the soap street and everything. With that blue phone, um, my biggest recommendation, and I know this because I dealt with this when the state made a terrible decision to try to have everything done through Middletown. Um, yeah. Make sure that blue phone is connected to Troop D. It would be. Okay. Yes, that's yeah. our primary. It yeah. would be. Tr- it would be tr- yeah. Troop D. I, I just I remember back when they decided to call, consolidate Agreed. all of it, and it it, we as EMS we would show up because we were called to the troop, and the person we were talking to on the blue phone had no clue who we were and why we were there. Yeah. So yeah. it's. Uh, no, yeah. we would be looking to connect directly to Troop D. Yeah. That would be the only connection point for that phone okay. would be Troop yeah. D. So that's what they're trying to work through right now is to figure out how that would potentially work. Yeah. I just remember that nightmare. Agreed with that nightmare. 
Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, we'll move on in the agenda. The uh, next item I just gave you a report. This is a report yeah. of all the legislative. I didn't want to incorporate it in my town manager's report. The latest, the latest. Yeah. The pain. Do you want to summarize? No. Okay. Are, are these ones that have already passed? This is what just passed from the 2023 municipal, uh, 2023 legislative session. These are all of the ones that CC, uh, the state summarizes this um, and s really sends it out to all the towns. Um, and it's those that they um, say, you know, have that are, are directly affecting municipalities. So this is their summary report of that. Um, I'm not going to attempt to summarize and it. There's too many of them. That report is available for view on the town's website. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so now we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, 14A, Unfinished Business for Town Meeting Action. Uh, consideration and action on the ordinance amending Chapter 7 to implement revisions required by FEMA to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this ordinance? So moved. Second. A uh, motion has been made by Ms. Wakefield, seconded by Ms. George. Uh, Ms. Collier, can you go over this, please? So this item is the revisions to the town's uh, flood management ordinance um, to have it be in compliance with the FEMA flood ins the flood insurance study that they completed and they revised the flood uh, flood maps <clears throat> this uh, was evaluated by the uh, state coordinator for the national flood insurance program um, their floodplain management division um, evaluated that it has been through our legal team they did also review it as well to make sure that there wasn't anything in there that was um, out of the ordinary he uh, confirmed that it is the same language that he has reviewed for every municipality that has um, that does have an ordinance not every municipality has an ordinance but the ones that do it's the same language um, and uh, it would, you know, if the town does not participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, it can impact residents' abilities to get or maintain their mortgages um, on their properties. Um, the ordinance subcommittee did review this at their June 27th meeting and voted to recommend this to the council for adoption. This um, item is <clears throat> the flood, uh, National Flood Insurance program does require action by the town before um, September 7th. Thank you. Comments, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on in the agenda. Next item up is 15A, new business. <coughs> Consideration and action on the resolution to introduce and set the date of September 12, 2023 for a public hearing on a proposed ordinance to authorize the conveyance of an access and utility easement to CPD Killingly LLC at 580 Hartford Pike. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this? Second. Uh, motion has been made by Ms. Murphy, seconded by Mr. Catula. Ms. Glorio, could you go over this, please? So this item would introduce and set the public hearing for September 12th um, on um, the granting of the access and utility easements um, for the development that was previously presented to the town council previously tonight. Um, the, as I previously mentioned, the uh, this easement was um, reviewed by the Board of Recreation because as under our um, policy with regards to um, property, um, we bring it to the um, commission that oversees the property for their input to bring it to the town council. So Board of Recreation being that it's um, the recreation facility, they met on uh, May 22nd and they unanimously recommended it for approval to the town council. Planning and zoning completed their approved the 824 review on this. Um, the assessor, as we've done with all of ease, all easements that have come before the town council, the assessor does an evaluation based on land value 
and square footage of the actual easement to determine the value of the of the actual easement. That value was um, calculated at three thousand nine hundred dollars, and so by charter, because that value is below five thousand dollars, the town council holds a public hearing, but the town council takes action on this, right? So it's only required for a public hearing. That's why it's not going to special town meeting. Um, the easement, the easement uh, document um, does make the developer responsible for all snow removal, repairs, repaving, and upgrades to the entire easement area. So that goes from the entrance of Town Farm Road all the way back to the development. So the, the current entrance that we currently plow, they would now be responsible for plowing um, and maintaining and repaving. All of that transitions over to that um, entity. Um, and there is, as uh, outlined previously, for the utility easements, there is a sewer easement granted to them within the same right away as that existing easement. And then the um, documentation of that drainage easement for the drainage, which is actually in favor of the town. So um, <clears throat> that's essentially the overall. I will say that, um, you know, as I mentioned before, um, at the staff level, we met with them to review um, the initial, you know, to review the easement um, area. We talked through many of the same safety concerns that everyone has raised. They've been very responsive to all of those, um, really talking through, you know, placement, making sure that we um, control traffic flow, slow traffic flow, putting in that four way stop has been critical. Um, and providing that safe pedestrian access um, into the site and into the facility. Um, they were um, very receptive when the, por when the Board of Recreation requested the additional sidewalk, very receptive to adding that, um, did, not, um, did not have a concern about adding that. And then also then subsequently with the conversations with planning and zoning, adding yet yeah, another sidewalk um, that's not part of the easement, but another sidewalk um, to gain pedestrian access, give additional defined pedestrian access from that skate park area back into the development. So, um, you know, they've they've heard our concerns around public around that pedestrian safety and the safety of our users of the park, and also having uh, continuous access um, for the park and being able to manage controls. We've gone through all of the, you know iterations of our events and how we manage the park and access to the park and all of that um, and they've been very amenable to how we manage that um, traffic flow so it's it's been um, a very good conversation the request here is that that payment of thirty nine hundred dollars um, for the ease for the conveyance of that easement gets appropriated to the outdoor trust fund that is the recreations outdoor trust fund and I um, recognize that because as with uh, and typically we see the sale of town property being an economic development one like the industrial park and we usually and usually the sale of town owned property goes to um, the economic development trust fund but as this is recreation property that's being impacted I felt that it was important that it be the outdoor trust fund for recreational purposes and that's typically utilized for um, upgrades to Owen Bell Park or to any of the other outdoor facilities. Any hey, question, Mary? What is what is the standards? Did we set any standards for that easement? I mean, if it's, you know, if there's a pothole that develops or something like that, you know, some damage, that's that's all will be repaired. I mean, is there any kind of so they would have liability around, you know, mm -hmm. if they if they're made aware of, um, you know, a pothole that's damaging vehicles and stuff like that, they have their own liability because they they do have liability for um, uh, for that easement area. So if somebody's you know property's being damaged because potholes are in there and stuff like that, they can go after the developer for lack of maintenance. Or well, like visual say it goes to hell you're typically going to see people going for um, uh, 
property damage before it completely visually deteriorates to the point where it, you know it's not passable right so you're you're going to see property damage first i mean that's our experience with our roadways um, and sidewalks is that people are generally you're you're seeing tripping hazards you're seeing all of those other con all those right. other concerns yeah, you start the sidewalks start to move correct and, and so hazards. people so they're responsible they're for the responsible for that well. that's the liability okay. they would be li liable for those thanks ultimately this motion is just to set the date correct this yep. just states sets the date for the public hearing Yep. You then receive the information through the public hearing, and then it wouldn't be September. It, it would be September on. when you take yeah. action. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any further comments, questions? And we already had a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstentions. Motion carries. We'll now move on in the agenda. Next item up is item 16: Council Member Reports and Comments. Uh, Mr. Whitehead, would you like to start? Thank you. Ms. Murphy? Um, agriculture, there was no quorum, I believe. Uh, wastewater, uh, they're working on their pump stations. They had a lot of rain, but they didn't violate. Um, they were discussing cost analysis of towns all around and what their fees were for tie-in, but they haven't come to any... Uh, <laughs> solution about how much they're going to raise rates or if they are or not. Um, Reynolds Street she already talked about and I think on the AC they're still waiting on the, the units. Thank you. Mr. Wood? No report. Mr. Cotula? Uh, Permanent Building Committee had a uh, another walkthrough at the um, KMS project and there's a lot of progress going on, a lot of activity there. There's a lot of sections where some of the utilities have removed already ahead of schedule, um, and, and there's there's a lot of things to work around and going on at the same time over there. And I think they're going to have a special meeting again this month for a walkthrough of um, Westfield Avenue to see that uh, progress over there. Thank you. Um, I did attend the walkthrough at KMS. Um, I also took a almost three-hour tour of the sewer plant a couple weeks ago, which was pretty fascinating. No, I didn't. If you want one, I'll make sure it gets put in your box. Okay. <laughs> Ms. George. <laughs> uh, no Board of Ed this month, and NECOG was canceled. Um, the board of rec was going was supposed to be Monday, and I was all set to go. And family emergencies popped up like jackrabbits, and I totally so I missed it. I did have a chance to talk to them. Um, things are moving along. Um, there will be a first aid CPR class in I believe October. And that's one of the ones I will be, that's one I always, I always offer to teach that for free for the Parks and Rec. So, well, I don't, I don't charge them to do that. I just do it because it's a good thing to do, so. Thank you. Ms. Barclay? For the planning and zoning meeting, I was at work. I did send them, um, and I did write up a report for the town meeting and for the Housing Authority, they changed the meeting from 7 to 3.30, and I was at work. <laughs> Thank you. And next item up on the agenda is item 17, executive session, and we have nothing. So item 18, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. A motion has been made by Mr. Wood, second by Ms. Murphy. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions, this meeting is adjourned.